real story behind the movie franchise The Conjuring begins with a rural farmhouse in Rhode Island. Built in 1736, it has gone by many names over the years, including the Dexter Richardson House and the Old Brook Farm. When the parent family purchased it in 1971, though, it was known as the Old Arnold Estate. In January 1971, Roger and Carolyn Perrin, along with their five daughters, Andrea, April, Christine, Cindy, and Nancy, moved into the Old Arnold Estate, located in the Rhode Island suburbs, a modest 14-room historic farmhouse situated on a 200-acre property. It seemed like an idyllic location to raise five children and the perfect place for an all-American family to live. At first, everything seemed great. 13-year-old Andrea, the eldest of the Perrin girls, had her own room while her sisters, 11-year-old Nancy and 10-year-old Christine, shared another. The two youngest girls, Cindy and April, also had another room to themselves. The house was big enough for all seven members of the Perrin family, providing ample space for the girls to play. However, even as their family settled into life at the old Arnold estate, Roger and Carolyn hadn't forgotten the final words of the man who had sold them the house. When dropping off the keys, he had mysteriously cautioned them to leave the lights on at night. Perhaps it had been a friendly warning from one neighbor to another. After all, America in the 1970s was rife with serial killers and gruesome crime sprees. But the man's sinister tone had sent chills down Roger and Carolyn's spines. And try as they might, they couldn't get his strange caution out of their minds. It wasn't long before several mysterious and unexplainable things started happening inside their home. The house itself creaked, slammed, and whispered. Carolyn also started noticing that things frequently went missing, with the broom seemingly moving by itself from place to place around the house. More than that, though, she heard scraping sounds against the kettle, despite the fact that no one was in the kitchen at the time. She would also find small piles of dirt in the center of the kitchen floor, even though it had been thoroughly cleaned only a few hours before. In an interview, Cindy Perrin, the second youngest daughter, said, Things would either be moved all around in a different position than how I left them, or they would all be shoved up underneath the bed. And I would go to my sisters, of course you'd go to your sisters, and ask, Hey, what'd you do to my toys? And they'd say, Nothing. Why would I mess with your toys, Cindy? No one discussed any of these events until much later. Andrea also had her fair share of disturbing experiences. As the eldest of the five sisters, she was woken many times in the middle of the night by her siblings coming into her room, huddling with her on her bed as they sobbed their hearts out. Eight-year-old Cindy, in particular, claimed that she could hear a menacing voice in the room that she shared with April. A voice that whispered, There are seven dead soldiers in the walls. Over and over again. Almost immediately after moving in, all five sisters noticed their house seemed alive with spirits. Although most of them were harmless, if not benevolent. They weren't always frightened of the ghosts and even befriended one of them, calling him Manny. According to Cindy, When we first moved into the house for the first two months, there was a woman that came and kissed me every night on the forehead that I thought was my mother. Her older sister Andrea added, Mom smelled like ivory soap and this spirit smelled like flowers and fruit. Some spirits, however, were more threatening. For instance, the family was kept awake at night by a voice crying out for its mother, and at exactly 5.15 a.m., their beds would be lifted by an unseen force. The stink of rotting flesh permeated through the home, and there were even apparitions, as well as doors slamming shut on their own. Another article published in August 1977 in the Providence Journal reads, Mrs. Perrin said she awoke before dawn one morning to find an apparition by her bed, the head of an old woman hanging off to one side over an old gray dress. There was a voice reverberating, get out, get out. I'll drive you out with death and gloom. 
All these incidents soon proved to be too much for the Perrin family. And in a bid to understand what exactly was going on in their home, Carolyn allegedly began reading up on the history of the old Arnold estate. In her research, she purportedly came across information about how the property had at one point been owned by the same family for eight generations, with many of the members dying under unexplainable or horrible circumstances, including drownings in a nearby creek, murders, and suicides. Eight generations of one extended family lived and died in that house prior to our arrival. Andrea Perrin would later say, some of them never left. According to the WJAR News, the Black Book of Burrowville, the town's former public records book, reveals that over the course of its existence, the property had been host to two suicides by hanging, one suicide by poison, the rape and murder of 11-year-old Prudence Arnold by a farmhand, two drownings, and the passing of four men who froze to death in addition to other tragic losses of life. However, claims regarding Prudence Arnold's death have been highly disputed, with local historians pointing to the fact that her official death record indicated that she died in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, which meant that she didn't lose her life on the farm. Furthermore, the record states her cause of death as her throat was cut by W.E.K., initials that contradicted the name of Bill Norton, which Andrea specified in her book. Some suspect Prudence's name and horrific death was included to help make sense of the reported hauntings. The parents were forced to remain in the old Arnold estate as they had spent most of their money moving in and couldn't afford to relocate. The parents had to stay. And soon enough, the benevolent ghosts were replaced with a more violent and visible force. By far, the most sinister and the most harmful spirit in the old Arnold estate was a woman named Bathsheba Sherman. She was responsible for glass suddenly shattering and objects inexplicably being launched across the room, smashing dangerously into walls. This spirit seemed to be particularly furious at the presence of Carolyn Perrin. One night, as Carolyn sat in the living room, she suddenly felt a piercing pain in her leg. Looking down, she saw blood trickling from a small stab wound in her calf that looked as if it had been caused by a large needle. According to Andrea Perrin, whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be mistress of the house and she resented the competition my mother posed for that position. Bathsheba constantly tormented Carolyn all throughout the 10 years that the family lived in the old Arnold estate. The torture was both emotional and physical. Aside from being stabbed in the leg, the spirit reportedly hid Carolyn's things all the time, which made her feel as if she was going insane. She also frequently felt drained and exhausted, making her heightened emotions even worse. Yet, on the other hand, Bathsheba was reportedly kind to Roger Perrin. The website History Collection even claims that he only saw Bathsheba's sweeter side with loving caresses and innuendos. Later, the screenwriters and the director of the 2013 film, The Conjuring, would be most inspired by Bathsheba Sherman's torments and based the majority of the film's plot on the horrors that she inflicted upon the parent family. While she may seem like a figure created specifically for Hollywood in the big screen, Bathsheba Sherman was very much real. Bathsheba Thayer was born on Rhode Island in 1812. In her early 30s, she married Judson Sherman and gave birth to at least one known son, Herman. Bathsheba and Judson are believed to have had three other children, with all dying at a very young age. From what can be gathered from public records, Bathsheba and Judson Sherman lived out their days at the old Arnold estate, both dying in the 1880s. Their son, Herbert Sherman, outlived them, dying in 1903. During Bathsheba's lifetime, there was one incident which marked the familial home out as a place of darkness. It involved the death of an infant and the accusation of murder caused by an incision at the back of the head. 
the infant had been in the care of Bathsheba at the time, and her neighbours were quick to accuse her of being a witch. Sadly, such an accusation was all too common a fate for any woman who was in any way associated with tragedy and had attracted jealousy. After all, Bathsheba had much to make her neighbours envious. She was beautiful, and had a husband who provided well for her and her young boy on a private estate. It would not matter that the justice courts found Bathsheba not guilty. The corpse of the infant would follow her for the rest of her life. Her neighbours continued to believe that she had killed the child. Many speculated that the infant had been sacrificed to the devil to bestow Bathsheba with eternal youth and beauty. Some rumours were all the more malicious, claiming that she had sacrificed her own children as well. From there, rumours spread like wildfire. The local community whispered that Bathsheba Sherman was a sadist who enjoyed torturing her staff, much like Madame LaLaurie of New Orleans in the early 19th century. When Bathsheba died, her body was said to have turned to stone. That was part of Satan's price for having granted her beauty. 